Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. The New York City Mission Society may not be a household name, but it has been serving needy New Yorkers for more than 200 years and may well be the oldest human services organization in the city. I'm pleased to welcome its brand new president, Elsie McCabe Thompson, whose previous role was helping to develop the Museum for African Art in Harlem. Today, we'll learn about this organization that has been serving changing groups of needy citizens throughout the city's history and find out what's high on its agenda now. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. So when was the Mission Society founded? By whom and for what purpose? 1812, and it was founded by um, some of the heads of New York, um, major philanthropists, you know, primarily Protestants. It had a church background originally, but we've What's separated. Was it a particular denomination or? Protestant. Okay, okay. And uh, we've separated from the church a while ago and are focused really just on serving um, without denomination, needy New Yorkers, wherever they might be. Right. 1812, that's a long time ago. I would imagine that the earliest clients, it would tend to be probably a lot of white immigrants or Absolutely. Just, yeah. Uh, because that was New York. I mean, back in 1812, you know, bringing uh, youngsters to the countryside meant bringing them to what is now uptown in, you know, in Harlem. Um, and that was the countryside? That was the countryside. <laughs> or because once upon a time when uh, Columbia was built, they built Columbia all the way uptown because they were close to a natural source of energy, meaning lumber. Yeah, this, the city has changed remarkably since then, and you're right. Uh, there were lots of Irish, um, English, and other you know, new the immigrants. Different ways of immigrants who were poor. Absolutely, needy. absolutely. How has, and I know some of your, I mean, your services, poor support, obviously, job training, libraries, some early libraries. Well, the thing about the Mission Society is its rich history. It has inspired the creation of a lot of bedrock institutions that we now very much take for granted, but at the beginning, they were novel. Uh, so our early you know, book lending program became the model for the New York public library system because we understood that you didn't just want to care for the spiritual needs of a community, but its educational, social, health needs as well. And you ran camps at one time. Absolutely. Do you still and run the camps? No, but we will again. Oh, okay. Um, in partnership with the New York uh, Harbor Conservancy, where I also sit on the board, we're going to start a camping program within city limits mm -hmm. because the Harbor Conservancy is the, the nonprofit you know, conservancy arm of uh, the federal park system. And there are federal parks, for instance, would you believe, in Staten Island. So one of our first camping programs will take place in Staten Island in the Fort Wadsworth area. Now, at some point, a lot of your programs are in central Harlem, mm -hmm. you notice. Um, when and why did you become Harlem-centered? Um, we're not Harlem-centered. Uh, a lot of our programs are there because we own a, a large building there, uh, which we'll be expanding. But we serve, you know, uh, communities throughout the Bronx. Um, we have a very multicultural um, program on the Lower East Side where most of the kids not only don't speak English or speak very little English, but speak a number of Asian languages and dialects. Which is, has your mission changed over the years? Has it stayed pretty much the same? Or well, um, some things have changed. The, the social pathologies associated with poverty have changed. So gun violence wasn't a problem 200 years ago. It is now. So in that sense, yes, uh, that's changed. Teen pregnancy wasn't you know, really a problem 200 years ago. It is now. 
how would you describe your, I mean, the demographics of your current clients? Um, poor. Primarily black and Latino, but as I said, in the Emma Lazarus School, for instance, you know, the majority are probably, um, you know, a variety. I'm not sure you can say the majority or anything, but mm -hmm. there's a very large um, Asian component. Okay. And how many people would you serve a year? Somewhere between seven and 8,000. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, with a variety of, of services. Right. One thing I've learned from doing this program and interviewing a number of the heads, heads of a variety of nonprofits, there are so many organizations in New York that do similar kinds of mm -hmm. social service work. I mean, you know, after school programs, tutoring programs for girls, careers programs, camps, sports. You know, for instance, we've had people on from Volunteers of America, Girl Scouts, the Fresh Air Fund, uh, the Police Athletic League. Uh, I also think about the work that's being done by the Harlem's Children's Zone. What do you feel sets the Mission Society apart from those groups? Part of what sets us apart is we are the inspiration behind the creation of many of those groups. So the Fresh Air Funds began after we started bringing uh, inner city kids, what was then a lower Manhattan inner city community into um, you know camping environments so that they could get get away from the day-to-day -day, um, stress of living in tenements and you know things like the visiting nurse service we realized early on in the mid 1850s that you couldn't just treat you know the educational or the emotional needs you needed to treat the physical needs of a community and started sending nurses into uh, low-income communities which gave uh, ultimately gave birth to the visiting nurse service um, the YMCA um, the uh, CSS David Jones's group right the Children's Aid Society. Society I mean all of those had their inspiration in the Mission Society do you have a you know Clearly, the theme is serving the needs of the poor, wherever they are. But do you have beyond that? Is are is there a primary for, for focus now? Or are there certain areas that you're sort of concentrating on? Well, I want to get back to uh, piloting some innovative new programs. So, for instance, we're not going to go back to the old camp model that we had once upon a time, where we had a physical camp location in Dover Plains in upstate New York where we would bus kids. Right. There's a way of, with just a metro card, um, showing kids that they can be urban stewards of a natural environment in, you know, in their metropolis. So there are innovative new ways of doing old things and we'll be coming up with some new things. So come back and watch and see what we do. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of the things that you are doing now. Um, you have your two programs that are aimed at people um, who've been in prison or mm -hmm. on, pro on probation, your Arches program and your Harlem Justice Scholars program. Tell me about those. Well, one of the, one of the social pathologies associated with poverty is crime. And when 25% of all men um, all men of color in central Harlem have been incarcerated at one point in their life. That is a crime. And we want to be able to stop that cycle because it becomes repetitive. If the only adult males you know are people who have been in the criminal justice system, that's not, we want to offer other role models that you don't have to follow that path, there are other paths that you can take. So in your Arches program, for instance, that helps people who have been, who are on probation, probation, are on probation. What kinds of things do you do with them? Is it a? Well, part of it is mentoring, part of it is leadership training, part of it is helping them learn that there are other people that you can associate with. You don't have to necessarily associate with you know, the same group or gang that's led you down the wrong path to begin with, that you have value and that there are opportunities open to you. 
you have something called Club Real Deal, mm -hmm. Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program. Tell me about that. Well, once upon a time, we had a president's wife who just said, you know, saying no is enough. And we knew that saying no was not enough. That for young girls and boys, you know, they needed uh, responsible sex education. They needed mentoring. They needed, um, you know, educational help as well so that they would learn that it's not cool to have a child when you're 15 or 16. As a matter of fact, here are, you know, the, the parade of dominoes um, that will happen if you do and what your life will be like, you know, as a result of it. So spelling out some of those, you know, unfortunate realities and showing them a, you know, that they can be leaders in their community. They don't have to be victims. How, what age do you start, in that program, what age do you start at with the girls? Um, in early teens and, and up. Okay, okay. Now, I, your, your website says that you boast a 100% pregnancy prevention rate? Yes. That's amazing. That, actually, that is amazing um, because lots of young girls think that the only way they can find love is in the arms of a, an infant. Um, not only is that not true, that's a very telling story about their own self-esteem. And now, we, are, we aim to fix that. Now, I happen to watch, um, well, I started out watching 16 Pregnant, moved on to Teen Mom, now I'm on Teen Mom too, um, which, I mean, it's, it's just, I, and I, I'm just transfixed by these stories. Yep. Um, because, you know, they all start out thinking, oh, well, we're, I'm going to give my child all the love, that, you know, that, and everything that I didn't have, and my boyfriend and I, we're going to be a couple, and we're going to take care of it, and it, it all crumbles you know, almost invariably, almost mm -hmm. invariably. And um, although sometimes I think, I mean, on the one hand, you would think that if young girls watch that show, they would, it would warn them off against teen pregnancy, but then some of them who want celebrity, and a few of the girls on the show have become yep. celebrities, so, you know, it might have the opposite effect, but it's very interesting. It's a very interesting show. We're gonna take a short break, and then we're gonna be back with more with Elsie McCabe Thompson president of the New York City Mission Society after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Elsie McCabe Thompson, president of the New York City Mission Society. We talked about some of your programs, and I'd just like to talk about a few more. Um, Harlem Snug, which seeks to prevent gun violence in Central Harlem, and I gather has actually been involved in mediating some disputes. Tell me about that. Well, um, you need to not only engage the community, um, but you need to engage the police department. And it's something we've been actually quite successful with. Um, you know, introducing teens uh, to what would be called street credible uh, adults who can help mediate and show them another path mm -hmm. uh, away from violence. So when we talk about mediation, are we talking about mediation between gangs or mediation between young people and the police? What are we talking about? Probably both. Okay, okay. You have something called Teen Action, which encourages service learning. Tell me about that. I'm a big believer in public service. Um, I have been involved personally in public service since as long as I can remember um, because I'm one of those um, old-fashioned, I guess, type folks who believe that public service really is a calling. And it's one of the things that drew me to the Mission Society, my own kids. Um, you know, when they said they wanted summer jobs and they wanted to do something, I said, you know, why don't you volunteer? And they said, well, where? And I um, introduced them to um, Yorkville Common Pantry, the um, 
now I guess it's New York Common Pantry. And my son worked in um, the, you know, uh, the pantry portion, my daughter worked in the soup kitchen. And it was a real learning experience, but it was also an invaluable experience for them as maturing adults. Um, my son said, Mom, can I need to earn some money because um, I don't pay allowance. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll pay you something for your work. Um, and it brought me to tears when I offered uh, his twin sister, my daughter. Uh, I said, you know what, I'll pay you too. And she said, and you know that maybe your message has finally gotten through when she turned to me and said, you know, service is enough payment. And I broke down and I said, that's right. Okay. Um Speaking of, su speaking of summer employment, you, you guys are also involved in the Summer Youth Employment Program. Yep. Now, what's your role? I mean, do, you know, it's, it's basically a federal and city-sponsored yes. program. Yes. Uh, are you a, so are you a sponsoring agency? Does that mean that you provide jobs at the Mission Society or outside? How does that work? Um, we try to find meaningful employment for them, um, but more importantly, we will pay a stipend uh, so that... To to, okay, for them to work someplace else or to work for you? Um, actually, I believe both. Okay. Um, okay. And since I just got there, it's one of the programs I'm going to find out much more about because having opportunities for kids to do something more more personally rewarding and more enriching than flipping burgers. Right, right. And flipping burgers is a job experience and it is a valuable one. You learn timeliness, you learn you know, uh, cleanliness, but if you can add an educational component to learning, it's, as the kids would say, more better. It sounds like a great program, although as, as long as I've been in the city and, and covering these things, the funding goes up, it goes down, you know, we're losing 10,000 jobs because of the federal money didn't come through. I don't know what point they are at now, but I know it's always gone back and forth. Where does the funding for the Mission Society programs come from? Uh, it comes from a combination of private philanthropy, but mostly it comes from contracts with different city agencies, but the portion of private philanthropy, it's one of my jobs, is going to be going up. A lot of social service organizations in, in New York City were founded in the 19th century or, be, or before even to help, as we said, the successive waves of immigrants rise out of poverty, become acculturated, fulfill the American dream. And many of those groups did. In the African-American community, however, and then although the community has made, you know, I'm the first one to say it has made great progress. I'm not one to say, I'm not one to say nothing has changed because so much has changed. Um, but many of the original problems seem to be intractable. We're talking about poverty, obviously, unemployment. Uh, you talked about the, the relatively new issue of gun violence, um, the teenage pregnancy, the educational achievement gap, I think is the one that, that disturbs me the most. Why do you, I mean, you probably weren't expecting this question, but why do you think that is? It's, and I'll indulge a personal story. Um, as a middle schooler, um, I was told by my middle school principal in a private middle school that, you know, I was one of the bad kids because I couldn't sit still in class. Um, I refused to go up and write on the blackboard. I didn't like speaking out in class. And when I did, um, I had a notorious reputation for asking too many um, probing questions. And it wasn't until adulthood that I was diagnosed as being acutely ADHD, borderline dyslexic, um, dysgraphic. Back in the 60s and 70s when I was in middle school, 
um, and high school, they only had two types of kids, good kids and bad kids. And if you had, um, if you didn't act to the norm, then you were a bad kid. Unfortunately, we know a lot about learning disabilities, but any kid who doesn't act to the norm is still labeled a bad kid. Um, any kid who has, who brings some of their problems from home, and they may be myriad and complex and troubling, they bring them into the school, their classroom. It's hard not to. Um, adults bring their problems into the workplace all the time. Um, it's hard for those kids to succeed. The, the gap um, isn't helped by um, an overemphasis on standardized testing to the expense, at the expense of other forms of creativity. And kids like me, um, you know, Barnard College, um, Harvard Law School graduate, I was told uh, in seventh grade that I not only shouldn't continue in my private middle school, uh, I probably shouldn't even consider a, you know, continuing on into a formal high school, and certainly not college, and definitely not something like law school. That wasn't in my future. But, you know, my mother wasn't hearing anything of it. Um, but not every, mo every mom can be like my mother. Um, and my mother, normally soft-spoken, can be a real fighter when you mess with her kids and you say that there's something that they can't or are incapable of doing. I'm always amazed when I hear those stories um, from, you know, black people who talk about how they were discouraged from achievement when they were by their teachers. I imagine that must have had something to do with there not being a whole lot of black teachers in the school. I mean, because That's I true. mean, I, I went to segregated schools in Birmingham, Alabama, and our teachers were always encouraging us to do whatever. So I, I must imagine. That's, it was also true that we were the, one of the only black families. Okay. But the school happens to be a great school, but I don't think they knew how, what to do with a kid that strayed effortlessly from the well-trod pedestrian path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a kid like me. Now, what brought you to the Mission Society? I want to make sure that kids who have real promise are never discouraged from pursuing the heights of that promise. At least it's not going to happen under my watch. And not only have I always been in public service, but until um, I went to the Museum for African Art, I was an art person. I was much more of a social service person. Um, I was in the Dinkins administration. I've started several service social service related nonprofits because that's where my passion is. That's, you know, I, I want to take kids that, you know, but for the grace of God could have been me. Of your many, many different kinds of programs, is there one that's especially dear to your heart? Or do you love all of your babies equally? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm learning, since I've only started at the Mission Society, I'm learning more and more about them. Um, and so far, every week, I have a new one that's near and dear to my heart as I learn more and more about them. Um, one thing I have discovered is the passion and dedication of the Mission Society staff. They're amazing folks who are not as well paid as they should be, but who are doing remarkable work with children every day, who stay late and work hard, just like most of our New York City public school teachers who you know, buy teaching supplies out of their own pocket because they want to positively affect the life of a child. You were at the Museum for African Art for 15 years yep. before you came to Mission Society. Um, what's the current st status of that? I know they have a location. They've started building. I think they some, need some more money in the, to continue the renovation, the creation of their current space at, where is it, 110th Street and 5th 110th Avenue? 110th and 5th Avenue. Uh-huh. Um, when I, my accomplishment there was I 
got all of the land, uh, came up with all of the financing and the money to build the core and shell and then some. Now it's up to my successors and the board to finish the construction and I understand they are doing that in earnest. Do they actually have a collection of art that's stored? I know it's actually, not open now. Okay. They do. Um, okay. It's a small collection. When, when I started at the museum, we were still a non-collecting institution. We were founded as a non-collecting institution, and I still say we, mm -hmm. um, because it is still near and dear to me. Um, and the museum, um, you know, with the promise of a building of, the, of our own, or their own, um, started collecting and have a small but wonderful collection but mostly um, the exhibitions they put together are from individual and institutional loans so things that might have been unseen for generations in the basement of the Met or the Traverne Museum in Belgium or um, you know in uh, Abuja you know, we will take those works, conserve them if needed, and, um, you know, put them into a wonderful exhibition, you know, assemble a fantastic exhibition catalog um, with the life's work of various scholars on the subject and travel that exhibition around the world. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank but you. But I'm sure that your... Um, coming years at the Mission Society are going to be interesting, challenging. Rewarding. <laughs> Rewarding, definitely. I want to thank Elsie McCabe Thompson for joining me today. If you'd like more information about the New York City Mission Society, you can go to nycmissionsociety.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.